I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco and for Emily Chang and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up in the next hour, clouds gather. Sources say that the FTC is widening its investigation of Amazon to include its massive cloud business. We'll have details. Plus, the stance from France. More on French President Emmanuel Macron's digital tax when we talk to the country's Minister of Digital Affairs. And give us access. Chinese tech giant Huawei sues the FCC for greater U.S. market access. Access. It's the latest attempt to fight U.S. sanctions, but does the case have legs? But first to our top story. So the U.S. government's cracked down on big tech and back to Amazon this time around. Bloomberg has learned that investigators are now looking into its massive cloud computing business. Sources say that the agency has been asking software companies recently about practices around Amazon Web Services. The unit is one of the backbones of the Internet, and it currently has a cloud computing market share of nearly 50 percent. It's the next biggest rival. Microsoft comes in at 16 percent. Joining us to discuss RBC Capital Markets Analyst Shweta Kajuria and in Washington, Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, who helped break the story. Naomi, I want to start with you. Are we surprised, frankly, that now regulators seem to be looking at almost every portion of Amazon's business? I think this is a surprise. Complaints about uh, Amazon's retail business are well known. Independent sellers have, you know, for years now been talking about, you know, ways that they think the company um, isn't treating them fairly on this platform. But complaints about Amazon Web Services, um, you know, have been a lot quieter. And so the fact that the FTC uh, sees this as an area of concern is significant, especially because Amazon Web Services is such a strong part of Amazon's overall business. Shweta, as you take a look at the company, respond to what Naomi was saying. The retail concerns had been highlighted here. What about that cloud computing business? Did it feel anti-competitive? Well, cloud computing business overall is a multi-trillion dollar business. And I was at the reInvent uh, conference, which is still going on, and Andy Jassy, who is the CEO of AWS, called out that the cloud penetration right now is still 3% on-premise is 97%, so the opportunity that AWS faces is huge. The fi almost 50% market share that you called out is you know, something that Gartner has publicly released, and that is of the IAS, infrastructure as a service market. But if we look at the overall tech market, it's still you know, a several trillion dollar opportunity that AWS is a small portion of. Uh, I'll just end with saying that we had uh, Mekol Del Rahim at our RBC Tech Conference who is the attorney, assistant attorney general at the Department of Justice for Antitrust. One thing that jumped out that he said was that being big is not bad, but big acting badly is bad. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I, I'll talk about it a little bit more, but that was a very fascinating statement, and that makes sense why they're looking at practices at AWS. And Shweta, just to follow up on that, when you take a look at the cloud space, from what I can hear on earnings calls, it seems like a competitive business. You have Microsoft, Azure, mm -hmm. uh, Amazon's cloud business, mm -hmm. Google's trailing, but they're number three. We hear that it is a competitive business. Does that maybe raise the bar for this hurdle to cross? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it is becoming increasingly competitive. We talked about the third quarter results where AWS uh, growth rate decelerated a little bit. And primary reason was because AWS is now seeing increasing pressure from Azure that grew at a much faster clip. And so, you know, AWS up until now has had, you know, a head start of seven years, but now th that is becoming an increasingly competitive market. Naomi, let me fold you back in here. In your reporting, you talk about now how some early interviews have gone on with uh, clients, customers, competitors. What are investigators hoping to glean from those interviews? We don't know exactly their area of focus, um, but what we do know for sure is they're going to be looking at whether there's specific market practices that Amazon's taking that could be deemed anti-competitive. They'll want to look at whether, you know, Amazon might be unfairly uh, excluding some of its rivals, whether Amazon is treating, um, you know, they might look at whether Amazon is treating uh, independent software 
uh, service providers differently if they also use other cloud uh, providers like Microsoft or Google. And so those are the sort of market practices that the FTC will likely be looking into, um, and we'll see if they end up finding anything that's worthy of a case. Uh, and Naomi, any sense on how Amazon has been responding to this? Amazon hasn't publicly commented, um, but we do see them, you know, talking uh, more publicly about their cloud business. They have shown no signs about, um, you know, that they're worried about this at all. Uh, so it seems to be at least publicly business as usual for Amazon. Shwada, does any of this have a real impact on the fundamentals of the business? How are these headlines really impacting uh, earnings or the share price? Well, it, it is a. Uh, I think that the antitrust risk at this point is sort of priced into the uh, Amazon shares that have pulled back year to date when we compare it to the overall market. Uh, not really, uh, or the retail performance year to date. Amazon has not done as well, and it is because of this overhang. One of the risks that Amazon has faced is the overhang from antitrust, and so I think it. Currently, in terms of Amazon stock price, it's sort of priced in because it's an overhang on the stock. But in terms of the overall operations of the company, I don't think um, I don't think that it is uh, material to the overall business. Retail is very strong. AWS is strong. Shweta Kajuria of RBC Capital Markets and Bloomberg's Naomi Nix, thank you both for joining us. Thanks for having me. And more on antitrust scrutiny, Senator Elizabeth Warren is acting on her presidential campaign promise to check the power of big tech and other sectors. Warren is drafting her own bill, which is uh, reviewed by Bloomberg, to restrict mega mergers. Her representatives declined to comment. To discuss the law she proposes, I want to bring in Bloomberg Technologies' Joshua Brewstein in New York. Joshua, this seems like a very wide-ranging proposal. How much of this could be really focused on big tech specifically? Specifically. Well, when Elizabeth Warren has talked about antitrust, she is usually using she's usually used big tech as kind of example number one. She's been very critical of especially acquisitions that Facebook has made. And so I do think that when you look at a bill like this, uh, she has big tech in mind. Walk me through some of the proposals that we're looking at, because in your story, you really highlight how it would expand antitrust law beyond what is so-called right now known as the consumer welfare standard. What is this approach? Yeah, so the main thrust here is that the consumer welfare standard has been sort of the underpinning of antitrust law for the last couple of decades. And that says that mergers will be assessed on whether or not they will cause harm to consumers in higher prices or um, reduced quality of goods. Now, this would add other, other factors to take into account, such as the effect on innovation, the effect on workers, and the effect on privacy. So that would be a pretty significant expansion of how the government would look at large deals or other antitrust enforcement. You know, expanding the law means you would have to go and change it. What are the odds that this actually becomes law? So this bill is pretty early. I think that even uh, a bill being introduced in exactly this form is not a sure thing. And once the bill got into Congress, you know, Congress really hasn't been passing anything of significance um, recently. And if it was introduced at the beginning of an election year, its uh, prospects wouldn't seem great. Any other uh, high-profile names in, in Senate or House that appear to want to go along with this, at least in its early version? Yeah, the interesting thing here is that um, David Cicilline, a representative who is leading the House Judiciary Committee's investigation into antitrust um, and tech issues, is also uh, seems to be involved in this. He would be an obvious uh, candidate to introduce new antitrust legislation. He has said that he won't do anything until that investigation wraps up, which would be uh, expected early 2020. Joshua, it was interesting that the law was also looking to ban non-competes and those no poaching agreements. Those are big in Silicon Valley. What could be the potential ripple effects if that were passed? 
Yeah, there are a lot of other provisions in this bill, which will be interesting to see if it does come up, whether they stay in. As you mentioned, there was um, language about non-competes, no poaching. There was also some language to try to guarantee the rights of gig economy workers, such as Uber drivers, to organize. Um, and so if those things stayed in, I think that would be pretty significant. And those are a bunch of different issues kind of thrown into one. In your sense, in your reporting, is there one that appears to be the bigger issue? Is it anti-competitive behavior or is it protecting some of the worker rights of, let's say, those Uber drivers? I think when you look at antitrust legislation, the real big target right now is acquisitions being made by the largest companies. Um, and so this bill would pretty much uh, prohibit them. Uh, when we take a look at the actual income statements, what was interesting is this uh, a law would ban mergers if one company has annual revenue north of $40 billion or if two companies have a combined $15 billion in revenue. We're showing here market cap. Basically, this affects all of the big tech companies. Uh, how much trouble are they in? Well, again, this is a proposal, so we would see. But if this became law, that would seem to preclude the large tech companies from doing something that they've really used as a way to get new services and, and grow um, over the last couple of years. Bloomberg Technologies' Joshua Brustein, thank you for thank joining you. us. And coming up, we'll sit down with Lo Tony of Plexo Capital, why the former Google Ventures partner founded his own firm and how he plans to bring diversity to venture capital. And if you like Bloomberg News, check us out on the radio. You can listen on the Bloomberg app, Bloomberg.com, and in the U.S. on Sirius XM. This is Bloomberg. Venture capital is coming to terms with its lack of diversity, and Lo Tony is leading the charge. The former Google Ventures partner founded his own firm, Plexo Capital, with a mission to invest in early stage funds led by women and underrepresented minorities. Plexo Capital announced today it raised a $42.5 million for its debut fund, and Lo Tony joins us now from New York. Lo, congratulations, $42.5 million. What are you using the money for? Well, first, thanks for having me. I really appreciate an opportunity to tell our story and vision. So we're going to use that money to invest into both venture funds led by a woman or a person of color, and then invest directly into companies that will source from the portfolios where we've made investments into venture capital firms. What sectors do you like right now? So we like enterprise and consumer. Typically, we go after VCs that are generalists and maybe lean a little bit more towards enterprise. I want to talk about how you identify these opportunities. Often there's a great idea, often there's a really good leader. What matters to you more? We do like to make sure that the market opportunity can support a venture scale return. That said, it's all about the ability for the entrepreneur to be able to execute, to be able to hire the right employees, have the right vision for the product and the opportunity, and then be able to raise the capital and, of course, execute against that. I want to talk about how you decide whether you invest money directly or go through a fund, because I think you've already backed about 19 funds so far, and then other times you choose to go direct. How do you decide? So what we do is we look for venture capital firms that we feel will be the next franchises investing in the great companies that will come out of the ecosystems globally. And what we do is when we find those great venture capital firms, we make an investment and we work with them to identify fantastic opportunities in their portfolio that we'd like to invest into directly. We also have a great group of LPs, including GV, Intel Capital, Cisco Investments, where they also make investments. So we continue to source deals for those firms through our network as well. Lo, I have to ask, why do you think Silicon Valley in particular has been so behind in coming to terms with diversity? It's a challenge that needs to be addressed, and we feel that our model is providing that leverage to be able to 
increase the opportunity within the ecosystem for diversity and inclusion. Our thesis is that women and people of color have a non-traditional path into venture capital and as a result end up with some amazing networks as well as a different lens to really be able to identify both market opportunities where there's not a lot of data as well as evaluate entrepreneurs differently that might not look like the prototypical entrepreneur. So you mentioned a non-traditional background or someone that doesn't look like a typical entrepreneur. How much then throughout your interview process do you really look at someone's background? What we like to do is spend at least 10 hours with each of the venture capital firm principles that we invest into, understand their judgment. Do they have the ability to be able to exercise good judgment when an opportunity presents itself? Also, really spend a lot of time understanding their network to be able to source deals. Do they have the ability to be able to source those deals? And then can they add value to those companies that are in their portfolio after they've written a check? I want to look broadly at the market here as someone who has capital in which to invest. Frankly, I hear all the time that there is so much cash chasing too few opportunities, and it really is leading to these heightened valuations. Where do you see us in terms of on a scale of a bubble and these overvaluations? It's always hard to be able to tell and time a market. I don't think that's something that should be done. You know, great opportunities tend to present themselves across the market cycles. So we like to make sure that we're in a position to deploy capital across the spectrum of whether the economy is up or down. Obviously, in the type of market that we're in right now, the pendulum has swung a little bit more in favor of the entrepreneur, but we've also seen situations where the pendulum might swing in the other direction and then valuations might come down a little bit. But I think that we'll continue to see great opportunities present themselves no matter what the economy is doing. Innovation doesn't know what the stock market is doing. What matters to you more? Is it strong corporate governance or a path to profitability? We like both. Obviously, what we're looking for on the front end in evaluating markets and opportunities is to make sure that there is a venture scale opportunity to provide the type of return that we need given the structure of our model and the risk that we incur so that our LPs can have the type of performance that they're looking for in this asset class. That said, I think it's very important to be able to invest into entrepreneurs that have a high sense of integrity and want to assemble a group of investors and board members that are going to provide them not only with the guidance but also the corporate governance as they scale and look to exit or potentially become a public company. And quickly, can you name one of your top picks for 2020 that you're invested in? Well, this is almost like having children. You never want to say <laughs> which child is your favorite. I will say that one opportunity that, that we do like is Blavity. It's a media company that's focused on millennials of color based in Los Angeles. We sourced that deal from one of our portfolio, one of our GPs or venture capital firms in our network, and then GV, Google Ventures, came on to fund that company. Another company I like is called Play Versus. It's mm -hmm. a company that's providing infrastructure for the esports space for the primary mm -hmm. um, high schools as well as potentially in the future other areas. Esports, it's all the rage. Thank <laughs> you. That was Low Tony of Plexo Capital. And coming up, what are traditional food retailers doing to overcome Amazon's high tech and increasing dominance? We'll find out next. And Bloomberg Technology is live streaming on Twitter. Check us out at Technology and be sure to follow our global breaking news network at Quick Take on Twitter. This is Bloomberg. With its algorithms, robotic warehouses, and cashierless stores, Amazon has become a threat to traditional grocers. In order to survive, food retailers have brought their game up, rushing to out-innovate the e-commerce giant. Joining us to discuss Bloomberg's Matt Boyle in New York. Matt, what are other traditional retailers doing to keep up with Amazon? They're doing a whole host of things, and it's uh, not easy for them because traditionally the grocery stores are pretty risk averse. They're not going to spend hundreds of millions on new technologies unless they're really proven. But because of the threat of Amazon, and, and again, it's not just Amazon, it's chains like Aldi as well, discount chains that are stealing a lot of market share. They realize they have to act, they have to act now. So they're investing in uh, a slew of different technologies, everything from the in-store robots that you may have seen in your 
your local grocery store to stuff that you don't even see behind the scenes like micro fulfillment centers which are like mini warehouses that pack uh, online orders uh, for shoppers. What has been the most uh, quickly adopted technology? Is it this cashierless technology or is it robotics doing those fulfillment of those aisles when we're all asleep? Well, some of the early technologies you might be familiar with, like you know, self-checkout, almost every store we go to has self-checkout, but that has glitches. You, know, you always have to call the attendant over because something happens. So what's really working for them, a lot of the, the shelf scanning robots is one that really has a huge payoff because every time you go to a store, you can't find something that you're looking for it's out of stock that's a lost sale for a retailer that is a big loss for them so if they're able to figure out what they're out of stock quicker rather than having you know the human employees walk through the aisles you know for hours on end if you've got the robot doing it for an hour or two uh, those are sales that you're quickly grabbing back and that translates into profit for these guys that's what they listen to Matt, are retailers trying to keep up with Amazon or just trying to keep up with the times? Because if you and I, if I remember conversations you and I have had, uh, Target, Walmart have actually done much better in their grocery space than companies like Amazon, which seem to be lagging. Yeah, exactly. I mean, tar the, yeah, Target and Walmart are doing well. Um, other chains are doing well, but it's the traditional sort of mainstream grocers, like Kroger is a good example. Mm -hmm. They've struggled over the past few years. It's these mainstream grocery stores that really need to up their game a bit. Walmart, you know, they're everywhere. They're doing a very good job in grocery. You're absolutely right. Um, but for the more traditional grocery stores, they need to up their game. How much is this costing them on the bottom line? Well, they're not saying much about it yet. And so far, at least, a lot of these are pilot tests. They're only in a couple stores. So it's not costing them a whole heck of a lot of money yet. But if they want to deploy these you know, at scale, it is going to cost them quite a bit of money. And then they're going to have to make decisions. Is this what we're going to spend it on or that? And those are going to be pretty tough decisions that are going to determine who the winners and losers are going to be going forward. And you know this better than anyone. The grocery business is already a pretty low margin competitive business. Are they hoping that the investments in the technology could boost those margins even by a bit? Exactly. Yeah. I mean, look at for one thing like out of stock products. Out of stock products cost food and drug retailers $325 billion a year. If they can, you know, gain just half of that back, you know, that goes down to the bottom line, certainly. So there are a lot of things that can, that can happen then that will be great for them if they can make it work. But again, they're still testing it. They're still figuring out what is the return on our investment here. But they have to act quicker because these days they're losing share left, right, and center. Ah, oh, Bloomberg's Matthew Boyle, thank you for joining us. And coming up, Huawei hits back. The Chinese telecom is suing the Trump administration. We have the details on their attempt to break through the ban. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Bloomberg Technology Global Link, where we join Bloomberg Daybreak Australia to bring you the latest in global tech news. I'm Taylor Riggs in San Francisco with Sherry Ann in New York and Paul Allen in Sydney. Let's take a look at those top global tech stories of the day. Paul. Thanks, Taylor. Google isn't just facing antitrust probes in the U.S. The U.K. is investigating its $2.6 billion takeover of Looker Data Sciences. On Thursday, the Competition and Markets Authority issued a cease and desist to prevent the companies from integrating services. The agency wants relevant information from the companies before December 20th as it decides whether or not to launch a formal probe. The U.S. is bringing charges and sanctions against Evil Corp. And no, it's not the fictitious company from TV's Mr. Robot. The U.S. Justice Department says the hacking group is behind some of the worst computer hacking and bank fraud schemes of the past decade. Two Russians are charged and the U.S. Treasury Department accuses the Russian government of links to Evil Corp. 
And if you're hinting to ban Huawei from the UK, you might not want to be caught taking a selfie with one of their phones. That's exactly what British Prime Minister Boris Johnson was guilty of on UK broadcaster ITV's This Morning programme, a day after he said at the NATO summit that his country could follow in the footsteps of its allies trying to ban the Chinese telecom from their networks. Those are the global tech stories that we're watching at the moment. Sherry. Paul, thank you. Now onto a more serious note regarding Huawei. The Chinese telecom giant is suing the U.S. Federal Communications Commission in a fight for greater U.S. market access. Huawei wants to overturn a decision that will hurt its business with its last big American clients. Their legal counsel told reporters the FCC is outside of its jurisdiction here. The FCC is a communications agency, not a national security agency. It has no expertise in national security, nor did it have authority to make national security judgments. That authority lies with the President of the United States of America, not an independent agency. Joining us from Hong Kong is Bloomberg's chief North Asia correspondent, Stephen Engel. Steve, so what exactly is Huawei fighting here? Yeah, you know, uh, Huawei is trying to get, uh, you know, preserve the last vestiges of, of its business in the United States. Pretty much the large carriers like AT&T and Verizon, uh, they're no longer selling the Huawei phones. Uh, they're not using the equipment. But the smaller rural carriers uh, have relied on uh, the more ubiquitous Huawei uh, network gear uh, that they can afford. Uh, and basically what the FCC did uh, is, you know, ban the, fe the use of federal subsidies uh, for these rural carriers to buy Huawei equipment, um, you know, and Huawei has now filed this uh, lawsuit in the Fifth Circuit Court of Appeals uh, trying to overturn that. Uh, basically, Huawei is fighting back. They're not taking uh, these, this blacklist that they got uh, from the White House in May, uh, as well as this FCC ruling and other efforts uh, to limit Huawei in the United States. They're not taking it lying down, and they are fighting it in the, the very... Uh, you know, the venues, the courts of the United States uh, that, um, you know, they're being a, a possibly accused of some pretty high crimes like espionage and using back doors to allow the Chinese government to allegedly spy. Yeah, so Stephen, you bring up those points. How does the court decide what is or is not a national security threat? As we heard from the lead counsel, he said that really is up to one person. That's the president only. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I mean, it, it, it's a, this is the legal point that they're trying to make. And, of course, the courts will make these uh, uh, decisions. And that's the, the good thing about the United States. I couldn't imagine uh, the same thing necessarily happening in the Chinese uh, judicial system if the roles were reversed. Uh, but this is, again, another, you know, just a chapter in Huawei's efforts uh, to combat uh, the perception, at least, uh, in Western countries uh, that they are providing... Uh, you know, an opportunity for the Chinese government uh, to potentially spy on Western economies and nations, which, of course, Huawei has denied vigorously. They've made a number of different actions, legal actions. Uh, in Paris, they, they filed a defamation court case uh, for comments that were made on TV, uh, allegedly tying Huawei to the Chinese government. Uh, they've made other, uh, you know, uh, court action in Texas earlier this year. Uh, and I believe, of course, uh, you know, the biggest, high, most high-profile case is that of uh, Huawei's founder, uh, the chief operating officer, chief financial officer, Meng Wanzhou, who, of course, is detained in Canada. Uh, and uh, she has filed uh, a case of unlawful detention in Canadian courts. Steve, I spoke to the FCC chairman, Ajit Pai, as they were making this decision. Take a listen to what he had to say. When it comes to the security of America's communications networks, we can't take a risk and hope for the best. We need to get it right, especially with something as transformative as 5G. And that's why when we've rolled out our proposal, we've made very clear that we don't want federal funds coming from the FCC to be spent on untrusted vendors, wherever they might be located or whoever they might be. It seems clear that it, this is as much a political move as it is a national security move. And yet, when it comes to Huawei's business, they don't seem to mind that much. 
Well, it's, it's significant because, again, keep in mind, uh, they are not able to use in their future phones and the, the current ones that are coming out, uh, the Google suite uh, of uh, products uh, on the Android pro uh, platform. So they're coming up with their own Harmony OS system. Uh, and I knew the new phones do not have the Google applications on their phones. So, you know, there are some limitations and they're going to keep on fighting this. Bloomberg, Stephen Engel, thank you for joining us. And plenty more global stories ahead. This is Bloomberg. Tensions between the U.S. and France are heightened over the issue of a digital tax and a tit-for-tat has ensued. In July, France passed a bill to impose a 3% tax on global tech companies with at least $845 million in worldwide revenue and digital sales totaling 25 million euros in France. On Tuesday, the U.S. retaliated with a threat to hit about $2.4 billion of French products with tariffs. France has responded that day, saying that the EU as a whole would act if the U.S. followed through. For more, we're joined now by Cedric O. He's the French Minister of Digital Affairs. Thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. And you're here, you're out in Silicon Valley, you're visiting all of these tech companies. Yeah. What are you telling them about why you did that digital tax? Well, I think there is a global concern, both within the U.S., but also uh, within Europe, on how do we set up a new regulatory framework. But there, there is taxation, but also privacy, antitrust, um, that is adapted to the new digital age. And I think that those startups, and even the biggest companies, they acknowledge the fact that we need a new level playing field. But I think the, the real question is, what is the setup of that new level playing field, and at what level? That's why we are favoring uh, um, an international solution. And we, we, that's true that we've been introducing a national tax, but I think the main issue that we are fighting for is to find a solution at the OECD level. And there were a lot of discussion with uh, both the Europeans, but also the American elite. And so do you view your tax really as a stepping stone to a broader multilateral OECD deal? Yeah, and actually the President Trump and also President Macron have agreed on the on the pattern uh, last, last summer that would say that we have to find an international solution that in the meantime France would, would be introducing that, that own tax but if there is some difference on the amount of money that the, the company would be paying we would, be, we would refund them if the international tax is lower. So, but I think the main issue is about finding an international solution. I want to talk about that because you want an international solution. You guys have gone the route of a, of a unilateral deal. The OECD appears to want more of a multilateral deal. Mm -hmm. Those are in conflict with each other. Has that hurt your talks and your progress with the U.S., with the OECD? So far it hadn't uh, because there was a deal that I was mentioning uh, this summer between President Trump and uh, President Macron. We had that deal, I mean, that, that we, we would rather favor for an international solution, but there would be that, that French tax in the meantime. And if there was to be some differences, we would refund the company. Um, so now there is, uh, was that uh, announcement from the US. Uh, but I think that the main issue is that we, we can find a, a common solution uh, at the OECD level. And this is really what's at stake, is that there is some solutions that have been suggested by the OECD, agreed by all the country. Uh, on the technical details, France has been making a few steps forward, ma many steps forward toward the US solution. Now the question is raised to the US administration, do, do you agree to the solution that is on the table? What do you want that broad framework to look like, in your opinion? But the, in, in the suggestion that was made by EUCD, there are two pillars. The first one is a minimum taxation, and there are some detailed question, but, but well, the basics are this is minimum taxation. Second pillar is that we have to rethink the way we assess the value of the presence of the company, not based on physical, uh, on physical things, but also on, on digital footprint in some, uh, in, in, in some countries. And we have to reassess the way we assess the presence and the footprint of the companies be it on the digital world, but also on, with other companies. That was uh, something that was asked by the US. And that we think that now in an international world, you, you don't need to rely only on physical presence in one country. How does a digital tax, though, help us deal with data privacy and antitrust? Oh, I think those are totally different issues. I think there's 
a, a broader concern about the footprint of those companies on our economies, but also on our democracies. And there are a whole set of solutions and a whole set of things that we have to address. Privacy is one of, the, one of them. Antitrust is, is something uh, also, but also taxation, regulation of, uh, of for instance, uh, hateful speech and things like this. We, we have to rethink the whole framework of our regulation in, to adapt it to the new world. So the French president has either said a unilateral deal with the U.S. will go through or he will look for a multilateral deal with the OECD. Which do you think is more likely to go forward at this point? Well, I think the ball in, is in the U.S. side so far. Um, I think as soon as the U.S. are ready to agree on the OECD solution, everything could be on the table and we can, we can go on with the discussion. But first thing is that do the U.S. agree to go for the U.S.D. solution, or shall we find something that is more European or more on a national way? I think this is the first question that is raised. So if the U.S. doesn't go ahead with some of the OECD's yeah. proposals and they've instead uh, retaliated with about $2.4 billion in, in taxes back on French products, are you prepared? Are those countries prepared for these retaliatory tariffs? Actually, I think this would not be a good solution, neither for the US, nor for France, nor for the companies that are at stake. Uh, and the Europe has always said that it would be favoring uh, an OECD solution, but if the OECD solution would not be issued, then Europe would take the initiative at its own level. So I think that this, this is what's at stake. If there is some retaliation from the US part, I think everything is on the table. Europe has said that it would be backing up France. So we'll see. But we, we still hope that there's some room for discussion and that we can find an, a solution at the OECD level. You say that Europe has been backing up France and wants a global a solution, but frankly, you guys are the only ones really that have gone through with this unilateral tax as of yet. Do you uh, really... Actually, there are other European countries that have been introducing tax or that plan to introduce tax. UK is one of them. Uh, Spain is one of them. Italy, I think, passed, already passed it low. And Austria already passed it low. So it's not only a French thing. And the European Commission has been saying by the voice of President Ursula von der Leyen that it wants a tax on digital companies uh, that, that is adapted to that new framework and that it is favoring the OECD solution, but would not, would it not be uh, adapted, then it would go for a European solution. And I think that we need to, to create that level playing field. The best level is at the international level, but if, uh, if the American don't want to go for that solution, then we will go for a European one. And you really feel that Europe is behind you? Oh, yeah. Actually, that was voiced by the European Commissioner on Trade, that Europe would back up France and would favor, would favor mm -hmm. uh, an international solution. But if at the end of the day uh, we have to go in that, in that discussion, then Europe would be backing France. I want to go back to that retaliatory tariffs that we were talking about, about $2.4 billion in goods. Have uh, you that's actually the, the base. The, the, there is, I think it opens... Um, a period of discussion of 30 days, mm -hmm. and it could be a little bit not as broad as, as, as two, $2.4 billion. So there is still discussion. So we don't know the setup of the would-be uh, uh, retaliation if, if they will exist. If there are, if it's that amount, have you spoken to companies back in France? Are they prepared for that? Actually, you're, you're never prepared for, for new taxation, but well, What's important to say is that we will go for the tax. The tax will exist because this is our, our sovereignty. Like we can decide within the, the agreement, international agreement that we have within the United States, the tax convention, it's not forbidden by the tax convention. So we, we have, we have the, the room to, take the, to, to implement the tax. If there is a unilateral decision from the US to take sanctions, then we will see what, what's be, what's being, what will be done by Europe or by France. But nevertheless, I think this is not a good solution, neither for the US, nor for Europe, nor for the companies that are at stake. How have American tech companies responded? Your meeting with Google, your meeting with Snap, what do they tell you? They tell us that they, they acknowledge the fact that we need a new international framework. And I think they are pushing for an international solution because it's, it's easier for them to handle only one system than to handle 27 or 28 systems within Europe or even, I don't know, 50 systems all around the world. So they are really fa in favor of an international solution. And they acknowledge the fact that an update of the, of the tax framework 
uh, all around the world with some, with some things that, is, that might be needed. Well, thank you for joining us. That was Cedric O, the French Minister of Digital Affairs. Thanks a lot. Now, smartphones may have changed the way we live, but some say it's come at a big cost to the planet. There are concerns that they're packed with metals mined in war zones, built in factories with questionable working conditions, and they're hard to recycle and difficult to repair. Now, one company in Europe is trying to change that smartphone completely. Bloomberg's Stefan Nicola reports from Berlin. The Fairphone 3 may look like your regular smartphone, but, but it really isn't. Um, it's made from uh, ethically sourced minerals. It's using recycled plastics. And the company behind it pays uh, the assembly line workers in China an extra bonus for every Fairphone sold. Um, while its tech specs uh, might not be comparable to what the latest iPhone or Samsung device has to offer, the key difference uh, comes actually in the box. It's a small screwdriver that owners of the phone can use to open the back cover of the phone and replace seven components in the phone from the camera to the battery to the display. That is uh, you know, a key difference to what other uh, phones have, on, have to offer. The previous two Fairphone models sold just 175,000 times but the device is now getting a major push from Vodafone, uh, Europe's biggest wireless carrier that's selling the device in five of its biggest European markets. That's good news for an industry that really is still lagging behind when it comes to sustainability. Um, last year alone, uh, electronics uh, were discarded with a combined weight of all uh, commercial jets ever built. So that's a massive amount of uh, electronic waste. And uh, if the Fairphone can help to cut that down, that's good news. Stefan Nicola, Bloomberg News, Berlin. And still ahead, recent departures of technology chiefs may seem like bad news to some, but one person thinks it's a good sign. That's next. This is Bloomberg. Let's take a look at today's top tech calls. Apple's price target was raised to 300 from 250 at Citi, which reiterated its buy rating and is forecasting strong results in the company's holiday quarter. The analyst said pricing strategies and recent demand trends are factors that will mean a better Christmas quarter than last year. Facebook got the equivalent of a sell rating at HSBC, which warned that the social networking company could be on a collision course with regulators. The analyst said that a growing number of policymakers and regulators are determined to take decisive action against Facebook, and it's potentially equivalent to nearly 40% of the stock's current valuation. And shares of Slack Technologies rose on Thursday, even after the company's billing guidance disappointed. Wedbush's Dan Ives said that forecast, which comes amid a boosted outlook for full year revenue, will potentially rule the day and keep a lid on the stock. He maintained an underperform rating with a $14 price target. And those are a look at the top tech calls. Lots of staffing shakeups this year at big tech firms with the most recent departure of Google founders Larry Page and Sergey Brin. And CalSTRS welcomes the news. The world's largest educator-only pension fund has pushed for governance changes at tech companies. CalSTRS chief investment officer Chris Aylman spoke with Bloomberg's Romain Bostic and Scarlett Fu earlier. Take a listen. Well, that's what we really think has to change is that dual class structure. The inspiration of a founder and what they bring to a company is huge, but at some point a company grows to be so mature it needs to be run by professionals. And that's different, a different spirit and a different structure than what some of these entrepreneurs are used to. And that's when they really do need to step away, mm -hmm. bring in more management, a more complex structure. And that's when we think they need to end up Oh, it's backing away from that dual class structure. We've seen over time that that does not work say past about seven years, it really should be sunsetted. But how do you then, how do you sort of force that change, particularly when you have, take a company like Facebook, which is still generating pretty good returns for investors. Uh, so, you know, you can look at them and say, well, you know, it works for us. How do you put that pressure on a company like that to say, this is better for you to have a structure that's a little bit more equitable for your rank and file investors? We never go away. That's how we put mm -hmm. pressure on. A continual, think about literally like a glacier, just a constant grind, a constant push. Mm -hmm. When the stock's doing well, then we don't get other people's attention. And you're right, the, the general view is we won't listen to you, the stock's done well, we're happy. Mm -hmm. 
But the minute the stock does poorly, then it's a recognition of, wait, we've got to look at some of the structural flaws in this company. Then we can get people's attention. And the fact that we've been there all the time with this message, that a better governance structure, more independent directors holding management accountable is a better way to operate a company. In other words, you nag a lot, which I get. And because you're consistently there, you're persistently there, it makes sense. What about bringing on other shareholders with you? How easy is it to convince yeah. the other investors to get on board with this idea? I would tell you that the vast majority of long-term investors absolutely agree with us. Whether it's here in Mizuno in Japan, uh, my friends in, in the Nordic region with the Dutch funds and the Norwegian fund, which frankly have larger exposure in the U.S. than even we do, mm. they absolutely agree with us on this. And that's when you want to, sometimes you want to sing a solo and sometimes you want to sing as a chorus. And Frankly, this is a better issue where, particularly, it's in our backyard in California. We'll be loud and vocal, but we'll bring in teams. By the way, your asset allocation right now, 50% to global equity. How much of, it is, of that is tech, global tech? Um, global tech is going to be right on the index weighting. Okay. As we're mostly passive, even outside the USA. So 